Uh, good evening and uh, good afternoon to all those people who have been here joining in this uh, seventh uh, webinar conducted by the Journal of Hand Metal Surgery. Uh, and uh, we have uh, all the eminent uh, uh, moderators and great teachers who have been uh, very diligently working on how to train the hand surgeons and how to promote or impart the uh, younger generations to come in. We all know that you know, gaining knowledge is the first step of wisdom, and then sharing to the next generation is the best step for, for good humanity. So with this brief introduction, uh, we welcome Dr. Vaikunth from Singapore, Dr. Felipe from France, and the moderator of the evening, Professor Dr. Sridhar from India. Good evening, everybody. Uh, you, you have a full screen? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Terence, for inviting me. So today I'm going to talk about deliberate practice as one of the uh, models for surgical training, especially in hand surgery or for surgery in general. Uh, this is part of my PhD thesis work uh, that I did over the last five years and it is, uh, was uh, funded by my institution with an educational grant and uh, uh, this is a PhD in education. And so I'll just share with you some of our conceptual work, plus also some of the uh, development, design and development of instructional materials that are based on sound educational principles. Um, my background is apart from hand surgery, I'm also a medical educator and an instructional designer. So I use all three domains to create this, this concept. So the, the five years of uh, research that I've done, uh, this is the summary. So uh, you look at this slide, you don't have to uh, spend time listening to me anymore. So the practice implication is, I think we need to relook at the way we are going to deliver surgical training uh, and mental skill training, the process of learning how to do deliberate practice plus mental practice will be the techniques that will be mandatory for young surgeons, just like basic surgical training. So they require this training. Faculty members need to have basic training in instructional design and technology so that they can be able to produce educationally sound instructional materials. So beyond just writing textbooks and procedures for uh, performing surgery, we need now to be able to be a, to create instructional materials that includes uh, enabling and facilitation for mental practice, which requires what is called a mental script. We'll come to a little bit uh, uh, in detail later. The creation the creation of an expert instructional video is mandatory, so we can't have enough people going around the world to teach. We therefore need to be able to bring the person asynchronously to all the students all over the world. The creation of a mental script is important. We'll later go in what a mental script is, which then needs to be incorporated into the instructional video. And then the design and development of high fidelity, low cost practice models so that deliberate practice can occur. So these require the, ex the expert panel, the, the subject matter experts to design it. So I think uh, Professor Levenor has gone through the definition of deliberate practice, but just to reinforce it. So it is repeated practice of a motor task. So surgeons, we are involved in the creation of a, a specific motor task in training. So it is structured in such a way to improve performance and you create various tasks and subtasks so that they can perform the action to the motor action to the point where they improve the performance to a level that is decided by the trainer and the trainee. And so that, that's, that's what deliberate practice is. So it is a, a, a highly structured motor activity from a deconstructed complex procedure to a level that is of, of, of a satisfactory performance to a level of expertise under the guidance and with feedback from the instructor. So I uh, uh, just uh, take it from there. So looking at the background, is there a problem? So traditionally, as Professor Levenor uh, explained, it has been one of mentorship, 
the apprenticeship model. We followed the surgeon. This has now been lost with the residency training program. There's a reduction in the training hours of uh, uh, surgeons this time due to a host of reasons from um, safety issues to the uh, a lack of um, training hours due to working time directives. And we are unable to train surgeons in the surgical room because of a host of reasons from efficiency to uh, uh, the lack of uh, opportunities for trainees to attend surgical training. There's been a political correctness of the non-surgical skills. Non-technical skills in surgeries are important. Don't get me wrong. It is not that it is not important, but a surgeon who does not know to operate is of no use if he's only good in counseling. So we need to go beyond that. So the, there's been studies, especially from Daniels and Giovanni, where it shows that most trained surgeons do not feel competent at the end of their training. And competency is not equivalent to mastery or expertise. So we have all kind of negotiated and bargained down our surgical training to provide safe and competent surgeon, but not necessarily masters. And we just left them in the community. So there's been a focus of that and that needs to change. So, so the challenges to surgical training is, I think Dr. Levin has gone through that, Approximately based on a 40 hour work week, you need 12 and a half hours, uh, 12 and a half years uh, to bring about a competent surgeon. I'm not talking about a master surgeon, but a competent surgeon. And that's that's how the length of time it is. But are we happy with just competent surgeon or do we need master surgeons? So if we need master surgeons or experts, then the, the reference, the criterion's reference for assessment has to change from a normative to a criterion reference assessment. So that's another different thing. So the, the, the problem is how can we create expert surgeons effectively and efficiently? And that was my research uh, problem. And over the years, I, I looked through the various theoretical background uh, for motor skill acquisition. So these are the four theories that I looked at and I conceptualized a new model for surgical training. So the Fitz and Posner's theory is a very well-known theory of motor skill acquisition. So the cognitive thing is we learn a motor skill, okay, I need to take a needle holder, pick up a needle and suture uh, a tissue. Then once we, are, we have seen it, we try it, then we try and learn the steps in our head. So this is a cognitive process through called neural encoding, where the synapses are created, new pathways are created. Then we keep doing it to practice. We reach a state of autonomy that is expertise where we can perform it without even thinking. So this is the surgeon when he is a novice, you cannot disturb him, he won't talk, he just operates very high cognitive load to perform a motor task. But the expert performs it with great ease and he can have a conversation with the anesthetists, he can uh, talk with the nurses and yet still be able to operate. The other theory that is there is the theory of social learning by Bandura. And this is called observation learning. And this is what we do. We observe the master surgeon operating. And that was what is now being lost because the apprenticeship model has been removed in surgical training. By watching the master surgeon, we, 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 have, an, we have become very attentive. We watch him, how he operates. Then we retain it. And then we try to reproduce it. And we need the motivation to do that. Then the deliberate practice of Ericsson is well uh, recognized and Ericsson got this from musicians, from piano players in the continent. And here you need to regularly keep doing that particular motor task repeatedly with specific activity and feedback so that that supports the learning. So what happens in the brain is called a Hebean modeling, where if you have a synapses that are constantly firing at the same time to produce a particular motor action, their new dendrites are formed to the extent in which you just have to say suture and immediately the whole host of motor action becomes one single action. And that's called command motor center. And this has been shown by Rizzolati's work and uh, Vilayana Ramachandran, who's a famous neurologist who, who invented the mirror therapy. Then we come to the fourth theory with the generals motor simulation theory. Now, simulation technology has brought us a lot of new things, but they are not easily accessible, they're expensive, not everybody has this. 
So the, man, the motor simulation theory works on the concept that thinking about doing something is all good as doing it itself. So the covert action of a particular task is as good as an overt action if you have prior experience of that motor task. So this is the basis, the four theoretical models that are used to create a new model. So we did a, a, a literature review and uh, basically we summarized and uh, we, we submitted this for the annals and it's awaiting publication. Uh, is that our 19 papers uh, on on uh, mental practice. So the John Rod's mental motor simulation to mental practice is effective in skill acquisition and retention. Uh, however, what we found there was lack of methodological rigor in the various papers that were published, and they all talked about the importance of a mental script for mental practice. A mental script is a detailed uh, explanation of how to perform a particular motor task, inclusive of kinesthetic cues. Hold the needle, feel the tension in your first web space as you hold a micro needle holder, see the needle go through, not feel the needle go through because there's no feeling in microsurgery. I'm taking microsurgery as an example. And there was no clear guidance on how to develop this mental script. So that was the basis of my conceptual framework to create this new model. So in the top, you see the learning theories that I've just mentioned through and the attributes are there. From these learning theories, what is needed is the creation of a mental script, which then allows for the development of an instructional media, which is the video. And then you have this instructional module, which you then use as an intervention uh, to validate this learning program for surgical skill acquisition. To design and develop instructional material, you require the science of learning, which is instructional design and technology. So these are the various models, the ADE model, the design and development techniques, and the Mayer's co uh, cognitive theory of multimedia learning. So we all learn by multimedia, sound, sight, touch, and, and the like, basically the two, uh, the audios and the visual. So coming to surgical training, what we need in a complex surgical procedure to create an expert, we require the person to observe the procedure of a master surgeon. So you need the master surgeon to perform, to demonstrate, and allow the uh, trainee to experience that motor task to produce that. From then on, we teach them the mental skills to have a motor imagery. Imagine the motor action required to perform that particular task. And then to practice this covertly in his head based on the memory that he had with, during the demonstration or the practice session. From that mental practice, as he now gets the uh, repeated action, he then goes on to deliberate practice. Now, deliberate practice is to practice it on cover overtly on a practice model. And then he takes that to the real world in the operating theater, gets it assessed and becomes a master surgeon. This is one of the tools that we developed in my research. And this is how to execute this theoretical model, that this new model. So we identify the motor task. And in this, in my research, we use uh, micro suturing in the rubber glove model. It's a cheap, uh, high fidelity, low cost model. What we did was we had five expert surgeons who are microsurgeons with an average age of 52.6 years old in Singapore. And we did a cognitive walkthrough. We told them to describe how to perform micro suturing in a rubber glove with all the kinesthetic cues of how they would hold the needle. And we took the narrative from each of the surgeon, um, uh, research assistant and myself, we then did a transcription of the, uh, we, we, we did, audit, did a video audio tape, and then we did a thematic analysis of the various things that each one said. We summarized it and perform a hierarchical uh, task analysis to then develop a mental script based. We took that mental script after collecting, went back to the five experts for validation and consensus development. After two rounds, we had saturation and there was consensus. 
Then we took this mental script and using the multimedia theory of Maya, created an instructional module, right, with 13 different chapters, and we deployed it onto a learning management system as a validated learning module on microsurgery. And then we introduced the motto task to the participants in the uh, final phase of our study. We used 20, uh, we did 22 medical students, but in the end we had only 20 because one from each arm dropped out. We introduced the motor scar task and in the control group, they just watch a normal video on how to perform micro suturing with a script uh, with the normal instructional material. And they did five days of microsurgical uh, practice and then they were assessed. The experimental group had one hour of mental skill training by me and they practiced twice a day uh, motor imagery and then came back to do the task of deliberate practice and then assess. So that's that's how you deliver. This is the tool on how to deliver this new model of surgical training uh, using deliberate practice. Sorry. Uh, so here is the results of the hierarchical task analysis, uh, uh, analysis for micro suturing. I, I won't go into the details. Uh, this will be available for you uh, on, on my website. You can look at it. It just basically how to align the edges, how to drive the needle, how to withdraw the switches. And so we did a, a detailed analysis of the tasks and subtasks that were involved uh, from beginning to the end. So it's a very highly uh, uh, um, granular uh, uh, process. And this is the mental script, and this is just a blow up. Uh, it's two pages long. The, the, the cues in red are actually for kinesthetic cues. It describes how you feel, uh, how, what, you, what to watch for, and just not the step of suturing. So it's quite detailed in process, and this is the uh, mental script. So this is the final module that is available. Uh, there's a URL there, you can go and see, and the various chapters are there, the 13 lessons uh, that goes through from needle holding to suturing. And just to quickly uh, run through that, I have another five minutes. So this is, we, we, we had a good face and content validity for the mental script that we developed from the expert panel. Uh, the script validation was done with 20 participants, both 10 novices and 10 experienced surgeon using a questionnaire called a Moto Imagery Questionnaire to see how confident they were of performing the task after listening to the mental script. And we had a very good Cromback Alpha indicating that it had internal consistency. And we also used, uh, th this is the, the MIQ, the Mental Imagery Questionnaire. These are questions that you ask uh, after you develop the question. And this, we use a storyboard to create the ex expert instructional video. We used the mental script, we converted it to an audio file, that became the narration. And then we had a master surgeon perform the micro suturing, and then we broke it up into chunks in micro learning uh, bits to create the learning module. This is the experiment, the, the, the pilot that we did through an experimental model. Uh, those are the things. When we looked at the time taken to perform the task, we had, they had five sutures to perform in a rubber glove model. There was, though the experimental group was slightly faster, but it's not statistically significant. However, when you look at the quality of the sutures, and you can see that in the left and the right, these are people who have never done any microsurgery. After five hours using the technique, there was a very strong statistical significance in the quality in the experimental group uh, we used a smart score, which is the Stanford uh, uh, microsurgery uh, resident assessment tool, and uh, it was significant. So, with that, I end there and I'll leave time for question. I, I think deliberate practice is in the current environment is the way, the strategy to increase the training level of our surgeons. I think they need to move from trainers of surgery to take back control of surgical training. A surgeon who does not know how to operate in a high level cannot be a surgeon because of the high stake involved in surgery. I think that's one recognition that I said. Uh, the role of uh, non-technical skills are important, but they do not make a surgeon. 
Number two, with the shortened time for surgical uh, practice and in certain areas where you do not have high volume practice, the role of mental practice with deliberate practice is the way to maintain and acquire skill set to an expert level. I think we should move away from just competency, which is the ground, and move towards excellence, which is the ceiling. And excellence has to be described. And leaders in, in surgical field need to retake the role of surgery uh, for training because I think a lot of surgeons, uh, are good surgeons, don't give enough time to write and research in surgical training based on the language of educational psychology and the language of teaching and learning. So uh, with that, I will, that's my comment.